Hello everyone and welcome to Handing the Shame Back. I'm Gloria Masters, I'm your host for this fabulous channel which is dedicated to all adults of child sexual abuse here in New Zealand and out across the world. As with other shows, this content could be triggering so please fabulous audience, if at any stage you feel triggered or uncomfortable, please switch off, go to the show notes below where you will be guided for help and resource. The other thing I would like to point out is that with our fabulous next guest, Kelly, um, there will be links put in to the show notes underneath so that you can follow her work and connect in with her as you would like to. So without further ado, it's 7am here in New Zealand. It's midday over in Portland, Oregon, where the fabulous Kelly Wallace is, and, and she's here with us. And, and just as I'm about to let her speak, keep breathing, Kelly, uh, let me introduce <laughs> you to her. <laughs> Clearly, she's a fellow survivor, she's an advocate, and she's a survivor and speaker for all things uh, adult survivors experience with this child sexual abuse. So wonderful to have her on board. She, she's also uh, writing her memoir, which uh, can be really challenging and applaud Kelly for that. And actually can't wait to read it. I've got to read it. Um, so yes, here we go. You can find her on kellywallace.org and uh, welcome to the show, Kelly. Thank you. So glad to be here. <laughs> Great to have you there. <laughs> I wish it was midday here and not 7 a.m., but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's what so happens early. with the, uh, people from all over the world. <laughs> yeah. So, Kelly, did, well, I, uh, I guess at the beginning, I always encourage people to give us a bit of a synopsis as much as you're comfortable with around um, your own history and kind of um, what's led you to this place and, and the fabulous things that you're doing. So let's just start maybe with a brief history of your childhood. Sure. Um, in December um, 1984, I came forward after watching a a child sexual abuse awareness video in my second grade classroom and um, realized that what was happening between my grandfather and I was not normal. And I told my mom basically what happened and the whole trajectory of my life changed forever. I uh, was the parent or I was the daughter of a lawyer in the county where my um, paternal grandfather, who was my perpetrator, was um, living. And my mom was recently divorced from my dad and my parents were basically in the middle of a con contentious divorce. Um, I have a younger sister who was adopted from Korea when I was about four. And um, she was very young when this happened. And so, Basically, after I told my, you know, version of events, my mom believed me and leapt into action and um, called the police, called the Children's Services Division, and I was kind of thrust into early intervention. I had therapy as an individual and group therapy with other little girls, I was seven at the time, who were... Um, survivors themselves. And um, I was also kind of thrust into a uh, legal system that I did. It was a complete surprise. I didn't know that I would have to tell my story over and over basically to detectives, um, the court. I ended up testifying a year later. So that's kind mm -hmm. of it in a nutshell. Wow, and wow, what a what a big load for a little girl. Um, yes. I guess we can only hope that the system has changed enough that small children don't have to go through that repetitive. Um, but um, Kelly, the program that saved you, 
what was the name of the program in 1984 can you remember they didn't it didn't have um it well it was there was no official like program basically it was um the children's services division had therapy set up um for it was a group therapy situation for about six months and oh no I mean so, the tv program oh. that you saw yeah oh sorry about that no, um no. you know it it was a video in my second grade classroom and I honestly do not recall the title off the top of my head and okay. I've searched for it I've searched for it and I cannot find it <laughs> but wow that is so powerful I, I in New Zealand for those watching from New Zealand we we have something um which is the the police come in it's part of the keeping safe program in our country and oh. the police come in and it's it, the there is sexual abuse right from the the day dot for our new entrants who are five years of age and they start talking about um this sort of thing and have um video clips and and lovely young police constables talk the children through what to mm -hmm look for and how to keep safe but the point is you had that you were seven years old thank heavens and the other thing is how was your mum isn't that beautiful that she yeah. yeah she she believed me and you know I I think because um my mom had kind of seen her there's a I mean as you know there's there's often a family history so yes. um my great grandmother had to intervene with my grandmother and i think my mom saw that um example where my great grandmother basically told the perpetrator against it was a family member um against my grandmother you don't you don't do that and he knocked it off and so i think you know having that as an example really empowered my mom and my mom was in a place where she also you know knew something was off about me that you know i was coming to her saying um that i wanted to die but before the time i was nine i had a lot of um really anxious behaviors and she couldn't really put she couldn't connect the dots but when this came out she was like oh this is this is why, why she, yeah uh, thank heavens and kelly was the duration of this from when you were quite little or did it start when you were seven and i don't you know the way that um trauma affects the brain and the memory i don't have a solid um idea of when it starts started i suspect that it was the first incident was probably around age four and um, stopped when I was around seven. And so, yeah. Well, um, you know, potentially, Kelly, and I'm going to take a leap here, potentially you kept your sister safe as well by, by talking. Well, that's a, that's a little, um, it's a, it's a, it's a little more complicated and I don't want to, Okay. Tell her. Yeah, no, no, no. You yeah, can't tell her yeah. story. But I mean, yeah. well, I guess all I'm saying is because you were the whistleblower, yes. it may hopefully have stopped in your family from. Yes. Yes. Well definitely. <laughs> it's really hard, isn't it, for children? And there's so many layers of this. And and your beautiful mum believing the beautiful young girl. And how powerful is that? Because Kelly, as we know, it's not always the way parents uh, struggle to stand beside or believe at times and uh, to have that as a as an experience where the opposite was true um oh it must have been such a relief for you. yes yes so after that point in the court case was that a successful conviction no 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 <laughs> okay. so um basically there were a lot of factors at play with um, my grandfather was, was found not guilty. And, um, a lot of factors at play, like I said, the, my dad was a, um, a attorney 
um, a district attorney in the same county where my grandfather lived Jeez. and was charged. He was tipped off by a social worker. My dad was tipped off by a social worker. And we think that he may have gone and helped my grandfather develop an alibi. And they had hired a legal team, you know, that they spent $30,000, which in 1985 was a tremendous amount of money. And there were other factors. The, the trial was originally supposed to take place in April of uh, 1985. I came forward in December 1984. So five months had passed. They, they pushed it back to July. And then they pushed it to December. So by the time that I got to trial and to testify, a full year had passed and my memory was very strong. My therapist was like, you have super strong um, recall of events. Your, your memory of what happened is very good. Um, but under pressure on the witness stand, being alone in a courtroom with my grandfather, my mom was not allowed to be in the courtroom. Um, and I had, unfortunately, I had my dad who was outside the courtroom doors, but there was like a little window in the courtroom door and he was watching me testify. And I was like, I can remember being on the witness stand and look, looking like, who is that? Who, who, who? And it was my dad. And so um, the, the trauma of, of all of that yes. resulted in a yes, um, not course. guilty plea. But also as an adult, I learned that only um, 5% in the United States, only 5% of all cases ever go to trial. And the conviction rate is 2.8%. So yeah. stacked, stacked, stacked. Yeah, It's no justice. And we can only hope that that has changed in 2022. Um, so I guess a... Uh, um, uh, just a question from me and, and potentially for our audience out there. Your dad clearly didn't have uh, the same place, the same value on you as his daughter. Uh, so that would have been, did, did you not have access to him growing up or he chose not to or? Um, I had access to him uh until about seven when all of this you know took place oh, yeah. and I had a good relationship up until this point and then when he decided to not believe, believe me you. inside yeah. with my grandfather it all kind of yeah. just fell apart and um isn't that interesting yeah. that your dad wouldn't believe you uh, uh yeah mm -hmm. as a lawyer yeah who was seeing yeah who was going through classes about child sexual abuse in the legal system because he was you know handling these types of cases yeah. and yeah <laughs> oh well thank thank heavens for mum and thank yes. you so much for sharing that I think that's um well quite a story for you and uh well what a lot of pressure on a wee girl so mm -hmm. so Kelly tell us about what what you you know when you think about being a speaker and survivor and advocate tell us a, a little bit about your speaking what what do you do well as a speaker I have been getting my story out on a variety of uh, platforms including podcast interviews and um, just sharing my story with um, uh, sexual or anti-sexual violence organizations here in the United States. Um, last month, I was featured as the RAIN Network, which is the largest anti-sexual violence um, nonprofit in the United States. I was the survivor of the month, so I was fever or I was featured on their front page of their website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It's big, big, <laughs> huge organ. They do a power of work, don't they? They do. They yeah. do. So yeah. I, I'm high, I'm thinking it's not a competition, but how do they choose survivor of the month? Because I'm that's, just that's brave a, audience. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. Well, a number of years ago, uh, about 10 years ago, I signed up with the the Rain Network. They have a speakers bureau. 
And, you know, so much time has passed. I think there was like an application um, I submitted and nothing, nothing, nothing really happened for a long time. I got mailings, emails, um, and I finally reached out to someone, I think last spring. And I said, Hey, I would, you know, I mean, I've been a speakers bureau member for 10 years. I'd love to share my story. And, um, a woman reached out to me who does the newsletter. She, mm. she reached out to me and, and said, we'd love to feature your story. So well done. Yeah. Yeah. That was, how yeah. is that experience for you? Oh, because the rain is so well known here. Yeah. In as the, well. Yeah. Mm. The, the woman that interviewed me, her name is Sierra Scott. She did a great job of interviewing me and just holding space. And um, the write up she did was just, fantastic and it was a super positive experience mm. that I would recommend for others yeah oh, that's yeah. so good and I'm glad you you mentioned that Kelly I observed uh, an interview recently I won't say who the the podcast hosts were but the way they were questioning the survivor was quite um intrusive and it didn't mm. actually I I don't know how he could have felt at all safe uh. um, and I think if they'd been asking um, someone with a, a little more confidence those questions or someone like me I might have said I don't understand why you would ask me that mm -hmm. I was a child at the time but mm -hmm. it was a little bit gratuitous and a little bit voyeuristic so yeah. I'm really thrilled to hear that the RAIN Network, and for those who don't know it out there, it's, this, it's the biggest organization in the United States supporting um, adult survivors of child sexual abuse. So well done, Kelly. I'll have Thank to look it up. You. <laughs> yeah. <to> look it up. <laughs> so yeah, so you do lots of, lots of speaking, which is great. And um, for, for you over there as well, I guess you, you know, as well as being a survivor and an advocate, I've looked at your fabulous website. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in that space? Um, yes. So I am, uh, as you mentioned earlier, I'm at work on um, a memoir. So on my website, there's a little bit of information about what my memoir is about. Um, I'm also uh, working on um, a new podcast, actually, um, called Recognize Our Power with um, Addie Tsai, who is a Houston-based writer. And um, we originally started that as a reading series. And in um, the springtime, we decided to convert it from a reading series to a podcast. So we are ramping up and getting ready to start recording, building our website for that and um, finding speakers to interview. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. How, how special is that? Yeah. So a lot, a lot of work for you, Kelly. And yeah, lots of work. <laughs> so how did you get onto that? What, what kind of gave you the, I guess the the idea, the podcast, the yes, what, what, yeah. yeah. Well, I listened to a lot of podcasts, and I um, decided several years ago that I, since I had such an interest in them, I'd like to be a guest on them. And so then I started, you know, trying to find all these different um, outlets to be guests, podcast guests, and um, then people kept asking me, "Why don't you start your own podcast?" Yes. And I was like, no, I don't have time. I don't have time. And now I just finally decided, you know, I've got the time. I know a little bit. I got the microphone for it. <laughs> <So>. Yay. <laughs> yeah. It's time. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. and there's something powerful about that. There's something very powerful about survivors finding their voices and you know, as as I'm sure you would um, 
perhaps somebody yourself or or encourage survivors themselves they don't need to be uh, speaking to an audience necessarily as the if they're struggling right. it's just about finding that one that initial person you trust um sometimes as you know kelly i i would be interested in your experience around this uh when people talk out when they find their voice sometimes people that are chosen to to have that shared with don't always know how to respond or don't respond at all well mm. uh, and then the impact can be to shut us down or have us feel a little more re-traumatized mm, certainly um, so how how did you find your kind of tribe or people that you felt comfortable to share with well, you know, my story is unique in that I have been telling my story in one form or another since I was a child because I was basically Believe. forced to tell it. So I got really comfortable telling, I would say in middle school, I started getting comfortable telling my friends um, in high school, same thing. So I, I've been very, very used to just sharing it with with I'll I don't know sometimes I'm a little too open and it can be a little like oh I need I need some breathing room yes. uh, that's a lot um yeah but my tribe um that is a really good question um so I think my tribe has kind of found me just because I've been out there sharing sharing it <laughs> A bit of a magnet, really. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly the magnet. <laughs> but um, what a gift and how, how beautiful for people, you know, to know where you are. And Definitely. Yeah. So what, what's your thinking? What kind of, you know, as we, we will have people um, viewing, we will have people commenting. What, what would you say has helped you through this, you know, from childhood? You haven't had to find repressed memories. It's always been with you. You were believed. Yes. Um, what, what's kind of helped you emerge through to be the amazing person giving back that you are today? Um, therapy has been, has played a really big role in my, my life. I, saw as mentioned earlier I saw a therapist when I was a child I saw uh, several different therapists in high school and as an adult I've um, continued with therapy um, and it's just that it's that reflecting back it's that validation of what happened to me um, that it has been super important. The, the interesting twist in my story is that the therapist that I worked with as a child, her name is Pam Crow. Um, she was just starting out and um, she is my therapist today. So wow. we re yeah, we reconnected <laughs> during COVID. And so <laughs> we've, we've been meeting um, virtually, but um, hopefully at some point we'll be able to have in office sessions, but it's been a great thrill to work with someone who knows my story, who knew me as a little girl when all of this was, was taking place. And that has been so great for me in my recovery. Also, um, writing has been just so, um, helpful again with that reflective um experience of people reflecting back to me that what I went through was not normal or nor was it right and so um writing literally writing through that trauma has been um meditative and I've actually gotten to have you know because I'm writing through the point of view of my mom and my dad and my grandpa like it's been interesting to go in and like kind of paint them as a little bit human <laughs> you know and, in a way that yeah, yeah. It, it would be so challenging I guess to you it's very it, challenging yeah 
and I I guess a question worth asking, <clears throat> Kate, I don't want to assume, do you actually still have a relationship with your father? I tried to. Um, as an adult, I yeah. had, um, throughout my childhood, um, I did not see him. And then in college, I had a, a little bit of a relationship with him. And then I stopped speaking with him for many, many years. Um, when I was in my mid thirties, I think, or late thirties, I came across a book called, I would, I thought I would never speak to you again, which was written by, oh, Laura Davis, who's a author here, who is a survivor of sexual abuse. And the book kind of opened the door to me or opened up a, the idea that I could have a relationship with my dad and it could be on my terms. And we started going to reconciliation therapy. And at that time, I didn't set the framework or the therapist also didn't set the framework to my, to my knowledge about, you know, is my dad going to have to believe me throughout this process of therapy? And so um, I had a relationship with him outside of the walls of the therapy rooms and um, my stepmom and my half brother, my half sister and my stepbrother. And for about four years, I was going to holiday events and they live relatively close now. Um, but right before COVID, it was kind of eating away at me that my dad still doesn't believe me. And this is really, really important to yeah. who I am as a person. And so I decided to terminate our relationship. Yeah. Oh, completely 100%. Yeah. Because there's a part of you that then has to compartmentalize or mm -hmm. hide, hide away the abused child. And as we know, because it begins in secrecy, continues yes. because of the silence, whether it's mm -hmm. threats or coercion, and then the shame for adult survivors who have not been believed, Yes. The shame then renders us incapacitated. So for you to uh, have ha try and have a relationship with your other significant parent uh, mm -hmm. when you're not believed uh, must have been very challenging. It trying to reconnect. Very and trying challenging. To, yes, because at yeah. one point, I imagine, Kelly, you have to honour you. You have to put you first. And, um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how strongly people fight against truth or struggle with truth. And do you, really, have any, really do you have any theories around that? This is pure conjecture, naturally. Um, but do you have any theories as to why he is so adamant in his disbelief of you? He was accused by a family member yes. of sexual abuse. Yes. So um, that is probably why. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah <laughs> not, uh, I mean sorry that's ridiculous I don't know what to say um yeah it's, no it's okay <laughs> yeah I yeah. understand so yes lots these it's never just a uh, one-dimensional view is it so for you to try and write from not one not two but four people's perspective um mm -hmm. you must wake up sometimes and think who am I today <laughs> No multiple personality <laughs> disorder here, thing. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my gosh. Exactly, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I hope you're protecting yourself, Kelly, as you're oh, doing the I writing. Totally, I totally yeah. am. Well, and thankfully, I'm at the end. So a lot of that, I should say that a lot of that was like, that was like laying the groundwork. Yeah, and so course. now I know my characters really well, and I don't have to, I don't have to literally be in them as much as as uh in the beginning so yeah yeah, yeah. No, I, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My goodness me. yeah <laughs> I, yeah 
you're just trying to think you're the you're the mother you're the father you're the um abuser abuser you're, you're the yeah. child survivor um yeah. victim at the time goodness mm -hmm. me I'm amazed you're not the <laughs> the police as well <laughs> or the therapist <laughs> come <Yeah>. on Kelly <laughs> there's more in you um, but yeah, interesting. Yeah. A, ho a whole yeah. whole different levels. And what I what I find beautiful about the show and having fabulous guests like you on, Kelly, is you know, for all of us, there's a complete, there's a different story and different themes emerge, which which I love because our audience is as varied as um, as anyone out in mm -hmm. the community who struggled with with a particular experience and for us this platform is solely for survivors of child sexual right. abuse our stories all vary but what emerges and what can be really helpful is is those themes and for instance the fact that you were instantly believed by by your beautiful mum we love your yeah. mum on behalf of all of us <laughs> thank mom. you <laughs> thanks mum and uh, your dad who maybe has uh been unable to find the courage due to his own trauma mm. um but still there's a child there who needed dad or daddy at that time mm -hmm. uh, so there's lots of layers and layers is yes. there you know you you talk about helping modalities or healing modalities therapy being one mm -hmm. uh, writing out mm -hmm. being another um, yeah is there anything else you would recommend to our wonderful audience out there it's been you know, a useful technique. I have, um, I started going to acupuncture and I have a huge mm. fear of, or I used to have a huge fear of needles and, you know, I have PTSD and actually PTSD, one of the symptoms can be having a fear of, of, of needles. It can be very uh, triggering for some people. Um, and I started going to this acupuncturist in February and her, the, the needles that she uses are very small and they're, she's very gentle with me. And, um, she listens to what I have to say at the beginning of, of every session when I come in and, um, it's just been really good to just go in and not have to do anything it's that somatic release of laying on a table for an hour and just having the acupuncture work it's work it's magic whatever oh, it's yeah. whatever's going on in there wow. <laughs> and so that that also has been beneficial for me as well so to, it's 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 a two for really isn't it two for one um, yeah. One, it 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 helps with that lovely somatic release, but mm -hmm. two, it also you, if you had a fear of needles, were well, you overcoming that? So yeah, there you go, audience. Try that. <laughs> the uh, the other thing too, I'd read recently, so be interested in your thoughts. Was mm -hmm. that for survivors, it can be really challenging going to a trauma informed dentist if there is such a thing. Yeah. I, dental work is something that I struggle with. I have to be sedated. I have to yeah. take an anti-anxiety medication. And that, that's a new thing for me. That only happened, I want to say in the last like five, six years. Um, because I, you know, as a child, I went to the dentist. I had no issues as a teenager into my twenties. And then something, something flipped in me. And so, um, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. It's a thing. It for is sure. A, that's our scientific yeah. term. Thanks, audience. It's yeah. a thing. So there you go. Go and Google <laughs> thing. But no, it is. It actually is. <laughs> it and, is. and to the point where dentists are looking at, or, you know, some are looking at becoming trauma informed because it's uh, a huge thing for us because we are put into a chair. We are <laughs> metaphorically, if you like, held mm -hmm. down. Yeah, we have to remain still, and our mouth is forced open. Um, yeah, but the, I, I think there's another one for me. You may laugh if you like. <laughs> is that with the dentist? You talk about needles. Have you seen the blimmin' horse needles they shove in there to anaesthetize you? Hello, 
Yeah. Trauma, I close my eyes. High yeah. trauma. Yeah. That is yeah. a mothership of a needle. That's not it a needle. Is. <laughs> it's a torture device. <laughs> It is. Anyway, I digress. So Kelly, yeah. what, what else would you like us to know about the um the work that you're doing and and um the way that you're working your way to supporting other survivors? Yeah, you know, another um a great tool that I found out about was through the Rain Net through the Rain Network's newsletter. I found out about this, um, it's a retreat for female survivors of, female identifying survivors of sexual abuse. And it's a retreat that's free. There's one in Utah and there's one in Georgia. I went in um, March and um, it was a four day retreat not therapeutic based they have therapists on staff but it was really um more focused on um connecting with other survivors there were psychosexual education classes nutrition classes um gosh what else tai chi yoga it was a great you know chance to disconnect and um I didn't have my cell phone on for four, four days, which is kind of a wow. little bit like, ah, cause I'm like super connected to it. But um, yeah, that was a great experience. And I, you know, there was someone there locally um, from the Portland Metro area. And we have since started going out to coffee and she's working with me actually on the um, recognize our power website. So, cause she's a web developer. Our website, oh, website developer. Yeah. That's yeah. so amazing. We've got a, a group here in New Zealand called Empower, Empower Me. Oh. They're a fantastic. And just as you're speaking, I'm thinking um, I'm seeing them tomorrow. I might actually say to them, hey, oh. consider doing a retreat because what a beautiful idea. And I know you struggled with the phone, Kelly. <laughs> too bad uh, but you see what it gave you was a disconnection yeah. from all the noise around you and being able to come in and I yeah. think our Empower Me group they do a great job thank you guys um yeah yeah for for survivors here in Aotearoa and I, yeah. I wonder if a retreat because as you say look at the connection you've made the commonalities mm -hmm. that you have um so how powerful yeah, definitely very, very powerful. Um, one of the other things, um, and I know this, this, I think some survivors may relate to this, um, is kind of similar to the dentist is going to the gynecologist. Um, yes. I, yes, I, um, you know, had, had been going to the gynecologist, um, and, last year with the anti-anxiety medication, it wasn't working. And so this year they offered to sedate me. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to go in and be sedated during my um, annual exam. And mm -hmm. I am so thrilled that that is an option to me um, or an option for me um, because it's, you know, I think as survivors, sometimes we don't always keep up on those, you know, regular medical appointments because it's so traumatizing. It's so traumatizing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad that that is an option. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that. And um, I think that's really powerful. And it leads me to as well, you know, a beautiful woman out there you know, well, hang in there because that that is a traumatic experience. Um, and I'm now thinking about our male survivors who actually yeah. go and get tested for prostate, mm. prostate cancer. And of course, yeah. the test that's done the way that's done yeah. um, would also be very triggering. So guys, uh, we are thinking about you as well. Um, 
you know, and I, I think there's, you know, potentially room for some of our health services to start thinking about having this. You know, you remember years ago, Kelly, doctors would be trained and people used to say, yeah, but where's the bedside manner? And now they yes. have a module around how to actually communicate. Hello, yes. I, I'm a person lying on the bed. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering the maybe more trauma-informed. Uh, yes you know, um, kind of training would be valuable. So beneficial. Yeah. So beneficial. Yeah. So yeah, just, sure. just thinking, um, you know, looking at, at what survivors have to experience, looking at, at what we emerge through and looking at what we still have to deal with. Are there areas, I guess, in your own life or areas you see with fellow survivors where, where you can see triggers would just happen like that or or where people would be um, unknowingly um, traumatizing people um, apart from yeah I mean I think that maybe it goes a little bit back to what we were kind of talking about earlier about your um, I forget if it was a, a friend or a, a guest maybe on your podcast who had been kind of re-traumatized by someone that he had told his story to or maybe the questioning oh was it, would, no, it was another podcast I'd listen oh, to oh yeah. right right it's yeah terrible. I mean I think the most important thing is just you know in regards to that is just by telling someone that that you believe them and that you you know you're here for them I think that that is so important um for survivors because for so many of us we're not believed and so hearing that right out the gate is so important for people Does that to hear. Seem, yeah and I love that and thank you for that because unfortunately it seems to be for the large amount of survivors that watch this show that they haven't been believed and as a result you know a b and c have happened and i a could mm -hmm. be they lose their family you know b could yes be they're then stigmatized as a liar or mm -hmm. deluded or whatever so there are many repercussions to this but how is that for you because that is just not an experience you personally had how how is that um that kind of sense of look I didn't experience that, but man, I hear about it. Does that feel like a real? Well, you know what it does for me? And I, it's a little bit of like, uh, I, and this is not, it's like, it's like survivor guilt a little bit, you know, because um, oh, Kelly. <laughs> so many, I mean, I mean, and that's like the only thing that I can really think uh, of, you know, because yeah. um, I, my experience was, so unique and that I was believed right out of the gate. And then I just, you know, I think 80, 90% of the people that I know who are survivors personally in my life have not been believed. And it's just like the links that people will go to, to discredit and just not believe. And it's like, we don't treat other victims of crimes like this. We don't treat someone who's been mugged like they're lying or they're making up a story. And so it's just, yeah, just mind boggling to me. Yeah. And, and I guess then it brings us back. And I love the fact that your empathy is so clear in this, Kelly. And the, mm -hmm. please don't feel the um, survivor. I know yeah, right, I know, I know. Because, you know, <laughs> it's it's how it should be. And yeah, and fantastic that we have a survivor who can say that. So I yeah. applaud you and thank you for that. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, for our survivors out there, we do believe you, um, stand beside you, Definitely. support you. Yeah for you to find the courage to even say the words says it all to me and I have said Definitely. it once before survivors are the group that I would consider the most honest uh, why because I understand what it takes for them to reach this uh, and yeah yeah definitely yeah. I would second that yeah 
So is there anything else you would like to share, Kelly, before we um, look at close out? Yeah, I mean, I guess the one final thing that I would say is that um, as a survivor, as a upper middle class white woman in the United States, I have been able to have access and resources to services that many people who may be in the BIPOC community have not had um, access to. So I feel like it's really important for me wherever I go to like really identify that and say that um, um, and just let it be, be known that I just, ha- yeah, I've had access to privilege um, because of my skin color. So I think it's really important to say that. And yeah, and, and that's thank, all I would say. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you for saying that. Um, yeah. And it's so not right I mean not that you were enabled to have that right support and therapy but that other people aren't and shame on you United States and other countries where that happens you have to yes live with, with this yeah um yeah. so thank you for sharing that and yes. Kelly please stay on the line while I close out with our fabulous audience audience Wow, what did you get from all of that? Isn't that fascinating what Kelly is not just been through, but what she's doing now and trying to share her story? Um, you know, amazing and amazing of you guys to actually be on this journey with us. Keep doing what you need to to release what you have to. Um, and please also for further resource and support go to gloriamasters.com have a look through the website and see what you can find that may be useful for you the other thing I would say is if you would like to be on the show I'm really more than happy to do so there is a bit of pre-screening simply because for some beautiful survivors out there Uh, they're not quite where they want to be and I don't want to ever exploit anybody so um, and the other thing I would end with as a lot of podcast um, channelers do is please like and subscribe this it helps us get the word out to other survivors this is self-funded a free service if you wish to donate go to the front page and you'll see how In the meantime, kia kaha, look after your beautiful selves and we'll see you next week.